Good afternoon. Welcome to what we are hoping will be the final session of the ITS course. This is Victoria Beal with the Ohio LTAP series, and we are so pleased to be able to bring you this training. Um, I know that it's been a definitely a topic that's been much anticipated, and I want to go over just a couple of quick housekeeping items, and then I'll get things turned over to Kevin Hunt, who's going to be your instructor for the day. Um, first off, if you didn't see my comment in the chat box, we would like for you to go ahead and place a hi or hello in the question box so we know that you found it. That is the location where we would like for you to ask questions throughout. And then the other thing I want to mention is in the handout section, we do have a copy of the slide presentation for you and also the reference packet and then a couple of other flyers for upcoming webinars you might be interested in with LTAP. So I believe that's all I have right now, other than to mention that for those of you who are seeking this for pre-qualification credit, who've taken this entire training series, there is a test that you're going to need to complete. And I will be sending out the instructions to the test to everyone who has joined for each of the sessions. So you need to have been on for both sessions last week and today's session and stay all the way through the end um, and then I will make certain that you get an email with the instructions to take the test. You're going to have a couple weeks to get that test done and I believe that's all I've got. So Kevin, are you ready? I am ready. Thank you, Victoria. Thanks. All right. So just uh, do another quick recap of our first two sessions. Again, on day one, we covered the references available to help you throughout the design process the policies that guide the use of ITS and projects, the various systems and components that make up ITS, and the communication network equipment that is critical to an ITS system. And last time, we discussed the physical infrastructure associated with an ITS system, the temporary communication requirements to keep the system operational throughout construction, provided some guidance on site selection for the ITS devices, and reviewed the components of an ITS design plan set. So today we'll continue with the plan development guidelines by discussing some of the calculations that are required to complete an ITS design. There are a few calculations that need to be completed. First is voltage drop, which will determine the size of the electrical cable that is needed. The voltage drop is the amount of voltage lost over a distance and is dependent on several factors. This equation can be used to uh, calculate voltage drop, the one that's on the screen. The load is the total for all the devices that are connected. The distance is from the power point of service to the ITS cabinet for that device. And there are standard tables for the cable resistance, depending on the size of the conductor and the material being used. The other factor is the voltage of the supply. 120 volts is standard. It's what the device is utilized to operate on but you can size it up and get a uh, 480 volt service. When you do this, your load is now a quarter of what would be at what it would be at um, 120 volts. But by using the 480 volts, you now need a transformer to step down the voltage uh, to 120 volts at the device. So these are all the things you need to, that need to be taken into consideration to determine your cable sizes. Basically, the longer the distance, the more voltage you're going to lose combat this, you would use a larger cable with more resistance or a higher voltage. Now, ODOT has a voltage drop calculation spreadsheet that should be used to determine the wire sizes. The spreadsheet can be found on uh, the Office of Traffic Operations website. And here's some of the important things to note. Uh, ODOT prefers not to utilize cable sizes greater than one aught and they will allow voltage drops up to 5%. So you can see in the example on the screen, the calculations have determined that the voltage drop will be 4.55% when using a number six AWG cable. So a number six AWG cable would be used. It's likely that if you drop down to like a, a 10 AWG cable, your voltage drop would exceed 5%, or you could use a four AWG cable, which is a bigger cable, to lower the voltage drop percentage, but now you're paying for a larger cable when it's not necessary. So I'll run through an example. 
uh, on the screen here, you've got uh, a, a site, a typical site for a CCTV camera. Toward the left, you can see the power source, which the power company owns. A service pole with a meter and service disconnect has been installed within the ODOT right away by the contractor. So the power company will be responsible for bringing the power from the power point of service to the service pole. And then this is where we'll, we'd pick up our calculations. So the information that you have here, the power company is providing 480 volt service. So that's our supply voltage. The distance is 130 feet from the power service to the first pole box, 45 feet under the ramp, 315 feet between the ramps, 50 feet under the second ramp, and 470 feet to the device. Now you also need to make sure you are including slack and vertical distances in your calculation. So in this case, you have five feet of slack at the power service where they're spliced together, seven feet of vertical distance from the meter and disconnect that is mounted on the pole to get underground, five feet of slack in each of the six pole boxes, seven feet of vertical distance to get into the cabinet from underground, and five feet of slack in the cabinet again at the splice point. This all adds up to 1,064 feet. And then for a CCTV site, we'll use 30 amps for the load. So now, bringing up ODOT's voltage drop, uh, drop calculation spreadsheet, we can run through that example. Uh, first, you should complete all the information under enter information here. Today, I'm just going to enter our supply voltage, which we said we're getting 480 volts. Next, uh, over in the, the um, table, you'd put in, so you're from and to, for here. For this, we're gonna do, um, say, service pole to the cabinet. We have a length of 1,064 feet, and we said the amps we're gonna use is 30. So you enter all that information in there. Now you need to determine the, the cable size. So under the AWG, we'll select the cable size. Start with, a, start with an eight AWG cable. And you can see here the voltage drop is automatically calculated using some of the resistance from the table down here in the bottom left. And we have over 10% for the voltage drop. So an eight AWG cable is not gonna be large enough. Next cable size that's one, one bigger would be a six. So it kind of goes in reverse order. We're still not there. Moving to a four AWG cable. And we have finally uh, gone under 5% a voltage drop. So we're at 4.26, 4.27 almost. So we would use a 4AWG cable for this installation. Now, some of the things we can play with, say our, our amps or load doubled and we had 60 amps needed at the site. You can see by doubling your amps, your voltage drop is doubling. So then you're gonna need a larger cable. Bring this up, I think, to a one would get us uh, back under 5%. So that's one of the factors that will determine, you know, the size of your cable. We go back to our original 30 and four. Say over here, we we can only get 120 volt service. And you can see here, now our voltage drop has quadrupled since 120 is only a quarter of the 480 that we were bringing. So in that case, we need to go with a much larger cable, I think all the way up to like three aught cable, which now gets us back under a 5% voltage drop. So you can see your, how your volts, your load, your um, service uh, voltage all relate uh, in this equation. Now, when you get to like a, a 2 aught, a 3 aught cable, I kind of mentioned that ODOT prefers to keep it under 1 aught. Those cables start to get really large and bulky. They uh, are more difficult to work with, more difficult to bend. So keeping these uh, cables on the smaller side is always preferred. So if you have, if you get to um, a cable like this, try to bring up 480 uh, volts to the site uh, so that you're not using these much larger cable sizes. Now we talked about a lot of this already, but the power service needs to be based on the load and the voltage drop wherever 
possible, the service obtained from the power company should be the actual power service you need. So if you need 480 volt service to meet your voltage drop calculations, work with the power company to see if they can provide that size service. And if you do, I mentioned if you do use a higher voltage, you will need to install a step down transformer at the device to be able to provide the 120 volts into the cabinet that the devices work on. The standard drawings that uh, are listed here provide a breakdown on the work that needs to be performed by both the utility and the contractor. And you can also see here that the loads, um, although the are fused, the disconnect is higher, they're fused at a, a lower uh, amperage. So for DMS, 80 amps is used in the voltage drop calculation. And for CCTV camera, 30 amps is used. And if you have any questions on what should be used, coordinate with ODOT and they can help you. Uh, determine the right amperage to use. Now related uh, is the size of the conduit to be installed. So within the signal design reference packet, there is a calculation spreadsheet that should be used to determine the conduit sizing. The calculation should be based on all the cables and wiring within the conduit, including the ground conductor. ODOT prefers to the combined cross section of all the cables to be less than 25% of the conduit inside area. Now per the NEC code, a 40% max fill is allowable for conduits with three or more cables. So as I mentioned, for ODOT's uh, designs, we're gonna use 25% fill. Section 450-3.4 in the TEM provides some additional guidance and table 497-1 gives conduit, cable, and wire cross-sectional areas to be used in the conduit fill calculations. The two tables that are shown on the screen are pulled from the TEM in those sections. So that's the information that you're gonna to wanna to base everything on. Here's the, this, this figure and equation is also included in the TEM. As mentioned, the information in the equation should be taken from that uh, table 497.1. So assuming we have three number four AWG conductors within a conduit, their cross-sectional is going to be 0.173 square inches each. We need to add those up, each one of those, to get 5.19 total square inches for the conduit cross or the cable cross-sections. Uh, on the project that we were talking about before, we anticipate using a two-inch conduit. So from the table, a two-inch conduit has an inside area of 3.36 square inches. 25% of that for our max fill is equal to 0.84 square inches. So the 5.19 square inches of cable cross-sectional area is gonna be less than the 0.84 square inches of conduit inside area. Therefore, we're under 25% fill and the, we're gonna meet the requirement and uh, able to put in a two inch conduit for that project. Now these calcul calculations need to be run for all the conduits to ensure the fill is meeting the less than 25% requirement. For all concrete pole locations, an embedment depth needs to be calculated. Essentially how deep the pole needs to be inserted into the ground. In order to pour, perform this calculation, soil information is needed from uh, borings. Now, there's a lot of information, existing information out there. I'm gonna bring up uh, ODOT's transportation information mapping system. So if you go into here, under um, map viewers, and then geotech, you can start to get some information on the boreholes, available boreholes. So here under projects, we'll highlight borehole locations. Now you see nothing has come up yet, but if we start zooming in, We'll start to see them pop up as we get closer. All right, so here's a bunch of bore. You can see, as I zoom out a little bit, you can see all these borehole information, too far, uh, available in the project areas. So I'll zoom in a little further. Say in this interchange, we've got a camera going in, and it identified some features. I can click on, this is, say, the nearest bore to where our camera's gonna go in. If you click on that, 
you'll start to get some information about that borehole location. Uh, it gives you the project, uh, the lat long, and down the bottom here, if you click on some of these links, it will give you actually allow you to access the report. So you click on here. This is the actual report that was done for the project. Gives you information that was was identified. Um, you can also get for that specific bore the log information. So here you can see that this had some brown clay at the top. You know, no no organics or root structures, some shale fragments. So this this gives you the information that you need to be able to determine your embedment depths. There's, uh, if there's no soil borings nearby, you are going to need to collect a soil boring, though. So hopefully, as you saw, there's a lot out there, and you'll be able to find um, one near nearby your, your camera pole. But regardless of how it's obtained, the information is going to be provided to the Office of Geotechnical Engineering, and they will provide you with the embedment depth to be included in the plans. One additional calculation that's required, if they're included in the project, are uh, for the ramp meter mass storms. Again, the signal design reference packet includes a spreadsheet that can be used to determine the mass storm height with or without an extension, the area moment design factor, and whether a dampener is required. Some of the inputs needed are the foundation elevation at the ground level, types of signal heads, distance the signal head and signs all are mounted from the support pole, elevations at the pavement under the signal heads, and total mast arm length. So this spreadsheet should be used for all mast arm sizing and pole heights related to ramp meters. All right, with that, we have our first poll question. Okay, let me get the poll question put up here real quick. And I'm launching it. It says fill in the blank. Typical CCTV is fused 60A, disconnect fused at blank. And everyone needs to vote. Just pick a, an answer, even if you're not certain, because we're not tracking the way you answer. Um, we'd like to get everybody voting here so we can have a, a good feel for any adjustments that Kevin would need to make. If you're not able to answer the question on the screen, please exit out of full screen mode and then it will accept your answer. We're almost up over 80% voting, so a few more people and we'll close it out. Okay, here we go. I'm closing that poll question. I'm sharing the results. We have 1% that chose A, 10A. We have 72% that chose B, 30A. 15% that chose C, 60A, and 12% that chose D, 100A. So with that, I'm going to hide that poll question, and Kevin, it's yours again. All right. Well, the majority did get it correct. Uh, the answer is B, 30 amp. So although the uh, disconnect is 60 amp, it is fused at 30 amps. And make sure you perform a voltage drop calculation when designing an ITS site to determine the proper cable size for a less than 5% drop based on the supply voltage. Drew, did we have any questions come in on this section? Um, yeah, we did. I can go over those real quick. Um, somebody asked about the worksheet. Um, that link was sent out uh, again to everybody and it'll also be in the resource documents. Uh, we are aware of an issue where it will require a login to access that sheet right now. We are in the process of getting that fixed. So hopefully in the next couple of days, um, you'll be able to access that off that website link that I sent out. And then the other question that we had was, does ODOT have cross-sectional areas for larger power size um, conductors? Uh, Charlie responded with, we do not. Only the typical ODOT sizes of half an inch through four inches are noted in the TEM table. Uh, if it is larger, it is or isn't typical or necessary desi necessarily desired. For instance, we would rather have a four inch over an eight inch one. 
and that was it. That was all we had. Sounds good. All right. Moving on then to determining quantities. Uh, so quantities need to be developed for all items on a project. The items will be pulled from ODOT's pay item um, master list associated with the various disciplines, not just ITS. So as I mentioned just then, ITS items should be listed on the, the master list or be an as per plan item. The last two sections of the items list in the construction and material specifications, chapter six, includes information on the method of measurement and the basis of payment for all those items. The method of measurement tells what work and items are, are included in each ODOT standard construction pay item, and the basis of payment tells how each ODOT standard construction pay item is measured for payment. Specific sections of the CMS and the related materials are listed here. And additionally, Supplemental Specification 804 and 809 also include the method of measurement and the basis of payment as the last two sections for the fiber optic cable and components and the ITS devices. One item I'd like to point out is in regards to traffic signal controllers. Previously, these were found in item 633 of the CMS, but now they are listed in Supplemental Specification 809. There's still some equipment associated with the traffic signals, like cabinets, auxiliary equipment, and, and accessories listed in item 633 that should be reviewed, but the controllers are now in SS809. And the ODOT item master list should be used to determine the item number and description and any special instructions that are listed. Special instructions can include adding a supplemental description to the item or checking the unit of measure. So make sure you check this reference that can be found in the Design Reference Resource Center. This is just a, an excerpt from the ODOT item master list. So you can see the item uh, in its extension along with the unit and description of the item. On this sheet that was pulled, you can see on the right there's a, a column for special instructions, but there's none here that have been listed. All right, supports and foundations are specified by type and are paid for in units of each. They each include a lot of associated items such as the pole, the weatherhead, anchor bolts, excavation, reinforcing steel, concrete, and backfill. Uh, additional information on the supports and foundations and their method of measurement and basis of payment are included in item 630 in the uh, CMS. We talked about calculating the embedment depth of concrete poles in the previous section. So what I want to stress here is for concrete pole, the length of the pole is the height above the ground. It does not include the embedment depth. Therefore, if you're calling for a concrete pole length of 70 feet and Geotech has given you an embedment depth of 12 feet in the ground, you need to get an 82 foot pole, but the length is still just 70 feet. And Another item on here, ground rods, they are quantified by each 10-foot section installed. They are required at every ground-mounted cabinet and pole, and it also includes the grounding conductor. Pole boxes use the units of each. They should be calculated for each type and size called for in the project. So an 18 inch, a 32 inch, and a 36 inch pull box would all be separate items with separate quantities. Additionally, if you have two 32 inch pull boxes, but they are a different material, they should also be quantified separately. Pull boxes also include the aggregate for the base. Conduit is calculated by the type and size and paid for in feet. Similarly, HDPE and PVC, or two inch or three inch conduit, should all be quantified separately. Conduits should be measured from the center to the center of the pull boxes or foundations when calculating lengths. 
conduit that is drilled under pavement is a separate item to calculate and includes any excavation and restoration needed to install the conduit via this method. This is also the case for conduit that needs to be encased within concrete. As designers, you will need to make a determination on how you believe the conduit should be installed based on the number of utilities, culverts, or pipes that need to be crossed. On these projects, coming to an agreement on whether you could go under or go over the existing utilities should be worked out with the local district and the Office of Traffic Operations. Trench is calculated and paid for similar to the conduits. Units are feet, and uh, trench is measured from center to center of its endpoints. The minimum depth is two feet, but the plans may supersede this depth, and section 1300 of the TAM does call for installation in a 30 inch deep trench. Trench in paved areas includes two different types, pavement less than six inches and pavement greater than six inches. In addition to the items for normal trench, this also includes the sawing and removal of pavement, along with the repaving over the trench. For those of you who are up to the challenge on this sheet, I'll give you a hint. Uh, the trench and paved area is in section 625.22, which is actually a highway lighting item. It just further reinforces that you need to look in multiple sections, not just ITS when designing these projects. Power service is paid for by each type. These are typically an as per plan item. So you may have multiple individual power service items as the power service may be different at almost every location. Additional information on the power service is found in both items 625 and 632 in the construction material specifications. Again, starting the coordination with the power company, not only in design, but also construction, can be critical to keeping a project on schedule. Cable and wire are both quantified in feet and are measured from center to center of their endpoints. So what's the difference between cable and wire? A wire is one conductor, a cable is two or more conductors. So if you have a 20 foot run that requires three conductors, but the item being specified is only for one conductor, your quantity is going to be 600 feet, three times 200 for that item, not 200 feet. So you need to be careful with what the item calls for and what's actually being called for on the plans when you're quantifying these. Also ensure these quantities include all vertical lengths and all slack that's being called for. Depending on the type of cable, there are various incidental items, so be sure to review the references for what is included in each one of those items also. I'll quickly run through a couple examples for calculating the power length. Uh, for a pole mounted cabinet, at, at the top of the pole, you can see there's a splice between the utility service cable and the project power cable. At this point, you're gonna have five feet of slack, then the distance from the weather head to the pole mounted cabinet conduit entrance, and then another feet of sl five feet of slack in the cabinet. So if the distance from the weather head to the conduit entrance was 20 feet, the total power cable length uh, for this pole mounted cabinet would be five for the slack at the top, 20 for the length of the pole, and five for the slack in the cabinet for 30 feet of power cable. For a ground mounted controller, again, the starting point is similar, but now the length of cable running down the pole goes into the underground conduit, then horizontally to the cabinet location, then vertically up again into the cabinet. So remember, fat, five feet of slack is included in the cabinet and at the original splice point. So assuming vertical distance for the weather head to the L in the underground conduit is 25 feet, and then 10 feet from the center of the pole foundation to the center of the cabinet, five feet vertically back into the cabinet would give us five for the slack at the top of the pole, plus 25 for the vertical length down the pole, plus 10 for the horizontal run from the pole to the cabinet, plus five for the vertical length into the cabinet, plus another five for the slack in the cabinet, which would give us a total length of 50 feet of power cable. And one additional note, typically the power cable and communication cable do not share a conduit. So separate conduits should be installed wherever possible to separate these cables. For service cable, similar, 
calculations apply. I'm not going to run through this one, but there is five feet of slack at either end for the connections plus the distance between the service poles. And keep in mind that this distance may vary. Not all those pole spacing may be the same. Add it all up and you'll have your total length of service cable. Detector loops are calculated as each and include all costs for installing and restoring the pavement. The detector loops tie into the loop leading cable, which is a separate item that is measured in feet. Additional details on each of these can be found in item 632 of the construction and material specifications. Information on the radar detectors can be found in supplemental specification 809.12. In this section is information on side fired, advanced and stop bar radar detectors. Regardless of the type, they are calculated as each, and all cabling, mounting, and hardware to make the device fully operational is incidental. For cabinets, there are separate items on the item master list for the various cabinets that could be used. There are some controllers listed on the item master spreadsheet, but there is also the option to use a general item and add a supplemental description under the special instructions. I'll point out that previously the cabinet item included the controller, but now these are separate pay items. So that's another recent change. Both of these items are quantified as each and the controller unit includes the software. Cabinets include the mounting hardware for pole mounted cabinets and anchor bolts for ground mounted cabinets, but, new, but do not include the foundation or work pad. These, those are both separate items. Don't forget about the ground rod. Quantify one at each ground mounted cabinet. Since this, each structure requires a ground mount rod, the pole mounted cabinets do not need one quantified for them as they can share the structure ground rod. The cabinet riser, which if you recall is the extension between, between the foundation and the cabinet, used to be a separate item, but it is now included with the cabinet item. Cabinet foundations and work pads are separate items and are paid for by each. One controller work pad may encompass several sides of a cabinet. For example, if you have a two-door cabinet, that one work pad should cover three sides of the cabinet foundation, including one of the non-door sides. For the method of measurement, and the basis of payment for fiber optic items refer to supplemental specification 804. Fiber optic cable and drop cable is quantified by the linear foot. There will be separate items for each cable type and strands of fiber. Microduct pathway is also quantified by the foot with separate items based on the number of cells in the pathway. These items identify the number of cells in the pathway or counts in the fiber so you would not multiply the distance as pointed out with the cable versus wire. The remaining items are quantified by each being installed. The thing you want to note is how the fiber places are quantified. Sometimes they're included in the item and sometimes they will need to be qualified separately, which I'll discuss a little bit more in a bit. With the new updates in July, the fiber optic cable item will include the total length of fiber being installed including any slack that is installed. Previously, the fiber optic cable is quantified from the center of the pull box to the center of the pull box, and any slack within the pull box was quantified as an each item with the location identified. This is no longer the case, so add all that slack into the total fiber length. Some additional items to touch on. The fan out kits are typically made for 12 or six fibers and is quantified for each kit required. The connectors that are attached to the fibers are incidental to this item. The drop cable is from the trunk cable to the termination point. This could be quantified by either each or by the foot. If measuring by the foot, make sure you include that slack and vertical length. Any cable support assemblies that may be needed to support the cables and reduce strains on the cable are incidental to this item. And there are a couple items that are incidental to the termination panel. When the fiber comes into the cabinet, there needs to be equipment that allows it to connect to the termination panel. 
These items are incidental to the termination panel and include the pigtails, pigtail splices to connect to the, the fiber to the pig, pigtail, um, connectors, patch cords, and splice trays. An emergency restoration kit is also incidental to be able to provide quick repairs if fibers are damaged. Under splice enclosures, this is where we want to note the difference. If you're building out a new system, installing new fibers and drop cables, the splices are incidental to the splice enclosure. <clears throat> If you're installing the splice enclosure on an existing fiber network, the number of splices need to be quantified and itemized separately from the splice enclosure. So this is that difference I was talking about earlier in uh, quantifying your splices. All testing to ensure the installed fiber is operating properly and with an acceptable power loss uh, limits is incidental to the fiber optic cable. There's also a lump sum item that uses the same testing procedure if a contractor needs to check if an existing cable is suitable for use. So that can be done on any existing cables as well. And then the fiber termination panel includes those items that need to be terminated, uh, need, to, need to be used to terminate the fiber on the termination panel. All right, we're at another poll question. just launched it and this one's a true or false question for concrete poles the length is the height above ground and the embedded depth true or false go ahead and pick an answer as i said before we are not tracking how you answer we just want to give the instructor a, a baseline to go from if this needs to be discussed or covered again so we got over 80% who've responded. I appreciate that. I'm going to close the polling out and share the results. We have 21% that chose true and 79% that chose false. So I'm going to hide that poll question results now and we're back to you, Kevin. Okay. Uh, this could be a little bit of a trick question, but the answer is false. Uh, the length is only the height above ground. This does not include the required embedment depth. You will still have to show that on the plans, the full depth, um, but based on the information given by Geotech, but the length of the pay item is only the height above the ground. Drew, do we have any questions on this section? Uh, yeah, we had a couple. I won't go over them again just because I sent them to them, but there was one that I did want to touch on. It says, do you account for SAG and the service cable length calculations? Um, the answer to that was um, it should be calculated point to point with no SAG. But other than that, I think that's that's all we got. Okay. Sounds good. All right, moving on. At the end of a project, after construction is complete, as-built plans for the entire ITS portion of the project needs to be submitted. The plans should provide, be provided in both DGN and PDF formats, as well as one uh, half-size hard copy plan set provided. Included in the ITS as-built is a GPS point accurate up to three feet for the locations of all pull boxes, poles, cabinets, and power services. This information needs to be associated with the appropriate device ID number. Meter numbers and utility provider for each power service should also be provided. And all of this needs to be done before final acceptance of the project. Now, some projects may require the use of ODOT's collector app for field locating assets. This is a geographic information system product that collects and organizes information on ODOT assets. A handheld mobile ready device such as a tablet or phone is used in the field to collect specific data points. The data points are all configurable so slightly different information may be collected for different types of devices. If you have this item you may need to include a special item 690 for as-built construction plans to gather this information. And this app is available on the App Store and you'll need a My ODOT account to be able to use it. All right, next we'll review the submission process. 
As previously mentioned, Section 1340-2 of the TEM includes additional ITS plan requirement checklists for each stage of submittal. Submissions should follow the ODOT project development process. The PDP manual can be found in, you probably guessed it, the Design Reference Resource Center. The PDP provides guidelines to identify activities required during each phase of project development. While it may provide the guidelines, the process also requires coordination with subject matter experts from all disciplines. Projects would follow one of five different paths based on the complexity of the project. It's important to point out that a project's initially identified path is just a starting point, but since it's a dynamic process, the path designation may change. The majority of ITS projects would probably fall under either a path two or a path three project. But regardless of the path that is followed, for any proprietary items or items that are not on the tap, the proper documents and paperwork should be submitted as early as possible in the process for approval. During preliminary engineering, the preferred alternatives should be verified. At this stage, a systems engineering analysis or systems engineering review form should be prepared, reviewed, and approved to move the project forward. Now, these are living documents. So as the project progresses, if something changes on the project, the SCA or the SURF document should be updated. Additionally, right-of-way impacts should be checked for any preliminary ITS equipment and cabinet locations. Stage one design is when coordination with the power company should begin with the locations of the devices determined after identifying the possible power sources. If any locations have moved from your preliminary uh, locations, right away impacts should also be revisited. Stage one ITS plans include base, plan drawn, base plans drawn at a one to 40 scale, existing ITS infrastructure, temporary communication infrastructure plans during, for during construction, and a project overview map. All plans containing ITS must be reviewed by the Office of Traffic Operations. So obtaining any preferences that they have or the district may have before the design begins is key. Stage two is when the detailed design occurs. These plans will include new locations for the ITS devices, proposed locations and paths of new communication and power lines with the pull boxes identified, power service locations, fiber termination drawings that we discussed, and the standard construction drawings and supplemental specifications listed on the title sheet. For the cost estimate, there's not always a price history available for ITS devices, so please coordinate with ODOT and they can help with developing a better estimate. Depending on the complexity of the project, you could combine stage submittals, but you should always work this out with the ODOT PM before moving forward in that direction. Stage three submissions should address all stage two markups with responses on how they were addressed. Don't just, uh, don't just address the comments in a vacuum. Coordinate with ODOT to ensure the comments are addressed to everyone's satisfaction. Uh, make sure you understand what they're getting at and addressing them properly. General notes, estimated quantities, and costs, and special de details are also added in during this stage. This is also the stage where you'll prepare and submit the calculations that we just went over for review. Tracings is the last submission uh, that includes all the electronic files, both DGN and PDF and a gem sum, which is a spreadsheet for the quantities. Similar to stage three, you should include a disposition on how all the stage three comments were addressed. Prices for special as per plan or lump sum type items can vary, so bid histories may not be accurate. So an estimate specific to the item should be developed and submitted with final tracings. So this section uh, or in the TM section 140-7 further defines some of the traffic control design submissions that may be required as part of the project development process. 
Potential submissions identified include an alternative evaluation report, the ITS systems engineering analysis, maintenance of traffic phasing plans, detour map, or signal plan sheets, and associated backups such as Swiss files or synchro files. So on that, we've come to our final poll question. I've launched the question. It's what section of the TEM section 13 can you find information on review submission? And you have your choices there for TEM section 1303, 1325, 1330, or 1340. They're not voting quite as quickly this time, but they're definitely voting. So we just want to get up hopefully over 80% here with the voting and then I'll close the poll question down. We're almost there. Okay. We've pushed over 80%. I'll share the responses with everyone. We have 11% that chose 1303, 7% that chose 1325. 21% that chose 1330, and 61% that chose 1340. So I'm going to hide those results, and Kevin let you share with them the answer. All right. Well, the answer is D. Uh, section 1340-2 has the detailed information on the different stages of a plan submittal. All right. Drew, any questions on this sec? the final two sections here that we just went over? Um, we just wanted to let everyone know that there was a quick fix. Charlie sent that out to everyone if you were trying to access the spreadsheet. Um, but other than that, uh, there was one question, is fiber testing per OTDR? And yes, that is what we use for the fiber testing. And that's it. All right, sounds good. All right, well, that actually brings us to the end of the course. So thank you for joining uh, during these three sessions. I hope you were able to take something out of them. If there are any questions that do come up, refer to the contacts list at the beginning that we listed at the beginning of the, uh, the presentation. And then just some parting words. ODOT is here to help. The Office of Traffic Operations staff are extremely knowledgeable about their systems and all the content presented during this course, have you seen how quickly they've answered these questions? If you're working on a project with them, collaborate as much as possible, ask them questions if you're not sure. At the end of a project, everyone wants to be able to point to a success, and this is the best way to ensure that. So with that said, unless any final questions or information you guys have or want to give out? Drew or Charlie, is there anything else you guys would like to add? I think we're all set. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Well, thank Look for thank you for attending. Yep. yep, definitely. And look for a follow-up email um, with the testing instructions. And also, we'll make sure to get a certificate sent out to wrap up your certificates. Um, so you'll have one for today's series. Now note that it's going to be um, for an hour instead of an hour and a half since we were only on here for almost an hour. So, um, and it looks like you're getting good kudos in the comment section. So, great job, gentlemen. Everyone have a good rest of your day. Thank you.